Good evening and welcome to the virtual global summit on precision diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer. My name is Claire Tempany, a radiologist at the Brigham Women's Hospital and professor of radiology at Harvard Medical School. This evening, I'm going to share with you some thoughts on the current and emerging imaging tools for improving risk assessment and selection of patients for prostate biopsy. Some disclosures, some NIH support listed here, clinical trial support, and a medical advisory board appointment. I'm going to try to cover some of the fundamentals of risk assessment and selection of patients and then touch on the emerging imaging modalities, focusing primarily on PIRADS and MRI, some about nuclear medicine and ultrasound, which will be touched upon and addressed fully in the next lecture. Risk assessment and selection for biopsy has historically been based in three major areas, history, clinical history, of course, focusing on family history of men with prostate cancer, fathers, grandfathers, the digital rectal examination, the measurement of the serum PSA, and now, of course, more recently in the last decade in imaging. What criteria are used to determine to biopsy or not to biopsy? In brief, it's all of the above, and more perhaps if one was to include serum biomarkers for this particular lecture, I'm focusing on these four areas. Selection of biopsy type is important. Once a biopsy has been determined, is it going to be a standard transrectal ultrasound systematic sampling, or is it going to be a systematic and targeted sampling? And targeted, of course, means that an imaging study has identified a focal lesion that requires biopsy. Biopsies can be performed in the magnet, which is called either in bore or in gantry, they're synonymous. Out of bore, which is done in a ultrasound suite usually, will be a fusion MRI, typically using MRI acquired prior to biopsy. Everybody's familiar with the risk stratification, which is uh, not new, but has been around for quite some time now based on level of PSA, the biopsy Gleason score, and of course the clinical examination. And these three combined have been able to give us a fairly good estimate of the risk and high of clinically significant disease or insignificant disease. So low risk, intermediate, and high risk based on serum PSA, biopsy Gleason, and clinical stage. Imaging modalities now that have been used to image prostate cancer over the years and currently are listed here for you, MRI, ultrasound, CT, and various nuclear medicine tests. MRI will focus on heavily. Ultrasound, as mentioned, will be addressed in full in the next lecture. CT scan is really primarily used to look at advanced metastatic disease with the presence or absence of lymph nodes. And nuclear tests primarily, again, for more advanced disease with bone scans and PET studies. None of these studies now deleted really apply in this talk for selection of men for prostate biopsy, unless it's in the recurrent situation or you're looking for lymph node biopsies or bone biopsies, which are not a focus of this talk. Just to touch on it, the nuclear medicine tests have expanded their repertoire and portfolio a lot in the last couple of years. A lot of exciting new PET-CT agents, flucyclovine or oximin for biochemical recurrence disease. And PSMA, of course, the gallium-68 is a fantastic new opportunity for evaluating men with low PSAs with suspicion of recurrence. So you can see with a PSA of less than 0.5 detection rate, of recurrence can be as high as 65%. C11 choline, not quite as good, but obviously has different roles. Now to get back to MRI, the pre-biopsy triage and screening, prior negative trust guided biopsies, elevated PSA are the two groups that we're really focusing on today, all of the others listed here. State of the art MRI examination consists, as most of you are aware, of the three pulse sequences, diffusion, T2 weighted, and IV contrast, dynamic contrast enhanced imaging. PIRADS, of course, itself has become the gold standard now for reporting out prostate MRI examinations. It's used by most radiologists across the world. PIRADS version 1 established in 2012, version 2 and 17, then just last year, version 2.1 was published by Turk Bey et al. And then membership of our committee here has expanded considerably over the last year with a more international group. And of course, uh, we're very fortunate to have the influence of two of the world's leading urologists representing urologic practices in geographically diverse areas. Remember, the IRADs, as they're known, are living documents that continue to change as techniques and knowledge is gained. Breast imaging is on version 5. This is the typical appearance of a prostate cancer on the multi-parametric, that's MP, multi-parametric exam. Most everybody's familiar with that at this point. 
the key sequence being the diffusion weighted sequence here in the bottom, this being the ADC partner of the raw diffusion, showing a very clear black area of restricted diffusion, synonymous with clinically significant Gleason pattern for disease. Pyrad's assessment categories range from one to five, five being highly likely that this lesion contains Gleason pattern four and or a volume of tumor greater than 0.5 cc's. This is the goal of pyrides, is to identify all such foci or all such lesions within a gland. Many papers have supported the role of prostate MRI now prior to biopsy, two or three of the key papers listed here, the Lancet article in New England Journal, which I'll come back to in a minute, the precision study and the promise study were all done in biopsy naive patients and had MRIs prior to prostate biopsy. Very important that they are very good at ruling out clinically significant disease. And the MRI targeted approach is superior to transrectal ultrasound for detection of clinically significant prostate cancer. Jürgen Futterer and others published in 2015, earlier than this, a systematic review of that based on significant number of studies here with the negative predictive values of MRI ranging from 63 to about 89%. Now, looking at the New England Journal paper a little more closely, this was the first global international randomized controlled trial. You break down the three groups of men based on PIRADS version two score. We can see here that a PIRADS three lesion is associated with clinically significant prostate cancer in only 12%. So the much lower, this group three is a heterogeneous group. Having said that, it is currently advised that all men with three, four, and five should undergo a biopsy of that given target. The evidence is very clear for the four and the five, the three less so, but you can see the high levels of clinically significant prostate cancer found in both five and in the fours, really very important group, and should a needle should be placed in, in all of these lesions. Now the PIRADS-3, to biopsy or not to biopsy, there's been quite a lot of data and I just wanted to take the opportunity to share some new data from our group with you, which will be presented at the RSNA in November, virtually by Camacho et al. We did a retrospective review of over 3,000 men from 2014 to 19 and identified 292 men with prostate cancer coded as PIRADS-3 on follow-up. And we did further follow-up, I should say, at 28% of these men had clinically significant prostate cancer. Of this group, they were associated with higher PSA densities and lower gland volumes. That's an important note. PSA density can be calculated and should be included in every prostate MRI examination report. We recommend target sampling. It's recommended that three to five cores should be taken per lesion. This is to ensure adequate sampling of the lesion and even the perilesional tissue. New PIRADS version two, as mentioned, was published last year. And just quickly to highlight what's new, technical specifications have changed for the MRI acquisition, clarification of criteria for improving the radiologist's interreader variability. We hope that these will help. It has not been determined yet if this has led to a reduction in the interreader variability, which remains a concern, but this is definitely a step in the right direction with all of these new criteria. And then we did discuss briefly the role of biparametric MRI at the end. Some of the examples from that paper were really classifying and helping folks define and understand the central zone region. Central zone is a normal part of the prostate gland at the base here, seen in the coronal view. But in this particular case, there's asymmetric low signal on T2, asymmetric low signal on T2, and then, of course, a paired high-low signal focus on the diffusion imaging. This was sampled and found to be a Gleason pattern four plus three on fusion biopsy. Careful area to look at, difficult area to follow and understand. And one of the areas probably fraught with most early reader lacking in experience, but most uh, problematic. Another area that was defined in PIRADS version 2.1 was the so-called fibromuscular stroma tumors, which you can see here, a very nice example of a large lesion up anteriorly at 12 o'clock, so to speak, just a little off to the side. And this meant target lesion of very significant cancer, Gleason pattern eight. The directed pathway, the, the MRI and multi-directed pathway paper uh, led by Anwar Padani and many of the PIRADS committee as well, helped to really outline the role of MRI in biopsy or no biopsy. And in the safety net is a concept that must be put in place for men who decline a biopsy or biopsies felt not indicated after low likelihood MRI. 
but needs to be followed and it outlines the responsibilities and circumstances that could trigger investigations further down the road. Another good paper that recently came out, again from the uh, leader of the New England paper, it was a, a meta-analysis published uh, last year in European Urology, looking at MR imaging targeted biopsy versus systematic, and the index test being the MR targeted. And you can see here in, on this forest plot, all studies that are on the right side, and of course the further to the right the better, are favoring the detection ratio for uh, the MRI examination and the MRI targeted biopsy. So biopsies to suspicious areas were better at detecting prostate cancer that needs to be treated and avoiding the diagnosis that, of disease that does not need to be treated, which is the role of imaging primarily. Now, ultrasound is also very good and can be better and could be better. But when dedicated studies are done, there's no doubt it can be helpful. So here's a nice study from the UCSF group, came out very recently, showing the close correlation between ultrasound and MRI. Many other reviews have been summarized nicely in this table by Dr. Padani, which shows all of the results for avoiding a biopsy. Relatively different numbers here. The MRI first was much lower, higher numbers in the 4M study. You can use MRI to avoid biopsy. Now, summarizing, where are we standing within the prostate cancer guidelines across the world? Looking at three of them, I've listed all of the types of guidelines. You can see there's really too many probably. But these three now uh, recommend MRI before biopsy. So the AUA here in the US, the uh, European urologists, and the NICE group, which is the oversight of the NHS in the UK, all recommend MRI before biopsy. A little more detail from the NICE uh, paper or study, which came out in 2019, recommends you should not recommend MRI, of course, to men who are not going to go on to radical treatment. Offering it as a first line is useful. And they, of course, are using a five-point Likert scale which essentially is pyrads. It's a, there's some nuances in the differences, but they offer the biopsy there as well to men with a score of three or higher. And cost effectiveness, we've shown this before at this meeting, this is, remains well established that if MRI is used for biopsy avoidance, it is the cost effective way. It leads to less biopsies. And these are in multiple different healthcare systems and financial systems. So in conclusion, major advances have been made in the past 10 years, particularly in MRI. The future developments will be multi-omics, including molecular pathology, assessment of germline mutations, circulating tumor cells, and mass spectrometry and other novel imaging techniques. Thank you very much for your attention.